And I said, so why, um, why would it be that you didn't uh, advise an inquest on this? So Dr. Reeve again got very nervous and said, oh, well, I just go on the facts. I didn't know. I didn't know about there's a motive for murder or anything like that. I said, well, even without the motive for murder, someone being found in a burning car is almost certainly indicative of arson, which is usually used to actually not only to uh, cover up other crimes, but to destroy evidence as well. But he couldn't answer. He said, oh, well, I just made my decision on what I saw. And since then, he's had no contact with me whatsoever. Now, for many, we talk about the autopsy. We've only recently served the autopsy for nine years Anne had been actually trying to get hold of the autopsy about her brother's death. And each time the Crown Office either ignored her requests. Now I think we can see why. We eventually got it, I applied for it, and they told me that um, they, they did have the autopsy, but it would be better if a doctor that they appointed would call us about it rather than send it to us and explain what the autopsy was all about because we might not understand it. We might misunderstand what's in this autopsy. So one of our doctors will ring you and he'll, tell, he'll explain it fully to you exactly all the implications and what everything means because you will, probably won't understand it. So at this point I said, well, look, send us the autopsy. We'd rather have it. If we don't understand it, we've got doctors we know who will explain it to us. So don't worry, just send us. And, and if we're not sure about anything, we'll find a doctor to explain it to us. Eventually, they did send the autopsy. This was three weeks after they'd said they weren't going to, to conduct the investigation. It arrived on uh, New Year's Eve 2009. In the autopsy, it was, it was made clear that a good deal of alcohol was found in the stomach of Robert Gregg. Despite Robert Gregg being the bar manager, he was a very moderate drinker. He didn't drink a lot of uh, he didn't drink a lot of alcohol at all. The alcohol that was found in his stomach was a, a brown liquid which was thought to be whiskey. Robert Gregg, unlike most Scotsmen, hated whiskey. He never drank whiskey. As well as that, there was severe severe damage to Robert's skull. Two ribs were broken, and his sternum was broken. All the experts, and they are acting informally at the moment, I would like a proper formal uh, sort of uh, analysis of this, but all the, and we've talked to a lot of people, believe that the most likely thing was that he was bad, severely beaten, caused the injuries that, that occurred, uh, had alcohol poured down his throat, and was then thrown into the burning car to die. We also believe that one of his rescuers, or so-called rescuers, was one of the murderers, because we discovered, or Anne discovered, that the person who had allegedly rescued him and got a medal from the Royal Humane Society was known to Dennis Mackey. Now, where this all fits together is, if I take you to 2001. Now, I should explain, if you're not aware of this, if people who have Down syndrome, um, don't necessarily link things together. But people like Holly, she is a competent witness, she's been described as a competent witness, not only by the police themselves, but also by medical experts who've examined her at the time to make sure that whatever she said could be taken seriously. So, that being the case, uh, Holly had, uh, was, there's no question about anything that she said. In fact, one of the experts actually said that Holly does not know how to lie. In her consideration, she does not know how to lie. Also, people who suffer from Down syndrome have very vivid memories and long memories. And they remember things in great detail, far more so than people who don't suffer from that kind of affliction. Uh, so, and they also don't have the ability to fabricate or close things from their mind. So you can see already what a terrible effect that must have had on poor Holly, who couldn't even blank out these terrible rapes and ordeals that she'd suffered for 14 years. But obviously, could there be a better witness? Hard to, I don't think it's difficult to find, I, I think it'd be very difficult to find a more reliable witness than Holly Gregg. So, uh, this went on and uh, we worked very hard to try and uh, sort out what is going on here. It's a very, very bad story. The Crown Office, um, just going back to the, the death of Roy Gregg, in 2001, Holly came forward with some more information to her mother that was previously unknown that will explain everything that I've just told you. One day, she said, Mummy, she says, I have to tell you, she says, you know, she says, um, Uncle Roy, he found me, he found Daddy having sex with me. 
Ham said, what? Oh, he said, yes, mummy, yes, mummy. He, he came in one day, he came to the house one day, and he came in and he saw, he found daddy having sex with me. And Anne said, what happened then, what happened? Uncle Roy said to daddy, don't you ever touch Holly again, don't you ever touch her. And Anne said, can you remember when this was? When did this happen? And through a process of elimination, they had found that it, it took, must have taken place between two and three weeks prior to, to uh, Roy's death. So Roy Gregg was murdered, we believe, on the instructions of Dennis Mack. He was supposed to have an alibi at the time. As far as we know, he was working on an oil rig. And the, the rescuer, by the way, was another oil rig worker who he knew. Or any, or, and or other members of the rape gang. Every single member of the rape gang is a potential murder suspect. So that is the story of, of, of Roy Gregg and what has happened there. So we are obviously pressing very hard on that side of the story as well. So we have multiple rapes and we have almost certainly a murder here. I asked Anne about, um, about her brother before he died. And I said to her, was there anything strange about Roy just before he died? And she said, well, not really. We were all trying to think that. It seems he died so in such strange circumstances, but we couldn't understand anything at all. And I've gone over in my mind, was there something strange about his behaviour prior to his death? And now I know what I know. She says, that, that makes, amplifies the fact. She said, all I can say is, knowing my brother as I did, he said he was a person, if there's a problem, he would, he'd usually like to think about it, first of all. He wouldn't just come out with it. He'd think about it. He says, and I did think at the time there was something on his mind that he, he wanted to tell me about. He said, but obviously I could have had no knowledge it was something of this magnitude. He said, I said, it must be just some personal problem. But there was something there that I knew he would talk to me about at some point, but he was, he was just thinking about it. I think another important thing just to mention is that it was Holly's 18th birthday, six days after Roy died, and he had planned the party for her. This was all planned. He brought a beautiful bracelet. So there was absolutely no reason why he would kill himself. And why would he, as he was so protective towards his sister and his niece? The last thing that he would ever want to do would be to leave them to the mercy of Dennis Mackey and the gang. But he had to be silenced to shut him up so that he couldn't testify, not only against Mackey, but Sheriff Buchanan and police officer Terry Major and the nurses and the social workers and the solicitor and all the rest of the despicable gang. He had to be shut up. So this is the, the, this, the case that we, we're having to deal with at the moment. It is a really, really appalling case, I think you'll agree, having heard all this. We've got a long way to go yet. Um, we are getting some support from some of the politicians in Scotland now at various levels who really believe that this case, that the lid cannot be kept on this case for much longer because we have so much documentary evidence. What we are looking for is someone in the media who's bold enough to do something about this. What I was sick and tired of hearing the major people in the media say, oh, we can't print, there's no proof, we'll get sued, and all this kind of thing. And I said, no, you won't. I said, oh, we've got the evidence here. There's no way this can come to court. And we could call us all as witnesses, Holly and myself, the rape gang, the rest of the victims. Do you really think that anybody is going to take you to court over on this? But no, they, we, well, I don't think it's to do with litigation. I think it's other people putting pressure on them, but there we are. But I was very concerned that nothing was happening. What I did in October, just going back to the 3rd of October, I decided that uh, I would go and make a, a public speech at the Quaker Hall in, uh, in Edinburgh. And I in doing so, I would name all the members of the gang publicly and all the known victims. Because I wanted them, if, if somebody was going to go for me, I wanted them to go for me then. So I did that. And I also sent it the, all the details to everyone, including... Buchanan's fellow, fellow sheriffs in Aberdeen. I sent them all the details to them at, at the court there. And so everyone knows about it. All the MSPs know about it. Uh, all the councillors in Aberdeen know about it. Everybody knows the background to this case. And I'm sure that very few of them can actually really dispute the facts about it. Has anybody got the guts to do it? The, the media know all about it. Has anybody got the guts to take this story further? I do hope so. 